And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming back in for the first time in several years, for formerly known as the cre as the creator of Fight, both 1st and 2nd edition, now coming back into the fray with the spy fiction bit of insanity in the form of Shadow Ops, the one and only Christopher Peter. How you doing today, man? I'm doing all right. How are you doing today? I am do I'm doing good. Um I keep hearing about a about a sto about a um s about a snowstorm that's heading into my area, but I haven't seen it yet. Um I'll know when I do I know when I will see it because I can just follow the screams. <laughs> and and yet spring is happening some 3 hours from now. Does have spring? Jeez, I'm getting gypped. <laughs> I don't have sp I don't have spring around here. I have winter and not winter. Spring just doesn't exist. And God. Sorry about that. Discord decided to derp on me. I was saying you you actually have uh, winter. You actually have um not winter. You actually have spring. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, where where I am, we do we do. It's it's brief, but we have it. It's nice. Huh. I mean, if it's if it's like two weeks and then it jumps straight to summer, that doesn't count. Well, well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I have four seasons: approaching winter, winter, still winter, not winter. Oh yeah, no, no, no. It's a little, little, little more seasonal where I am, which is nice sometimes. So. Shadow Ops, as I understand it, is yes. trying to do spy fiction, but doing spy fiction in the more cinematic en end of things. And when it comes to spy fiction, I've had a bit of a um, pendulum. You swing on okay. one end, and you get, like, James Bond. You know, the, la mm -hmm. the larger-than-life characters, the exotic locales, all that kind of stuff. You swing the other way, you have J you have your Jason Bournes, your Tom Clancy's, that kind of thing. That sort of hyper grounded, some get some of the video games notwithstanding uh, mm -hmm. appro approach, minus the shaky cam that was in the Bourne movies. Um, where on that pendulum is Shadow Ops? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I think I, in your pendulum example, I would have I would have swung the pendulum even further back than Jason Bourne uh, to something like you know uh, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, you know something in the the Jean Le Carre mode, uh, where you get where where the spy action is you know the the, the tension is waiting for a telephone to ring or uh, you know in a more modern version of you know analyzing forensic spreadsheets and and certainly Shadow Ops is nothing of that. But um, if I have to choose between the Jason Bourne, somewhat more grounded, and the the over the top James Bond, uh, um, well, I like both to be honest. My my touchstone actually, my largest touchstone for the game was actually the later Mission Impossible movies. Um, so I guess that's probably skewing more towards Bond than Bourne. Uh, but the difference, a really important difference for a role-playing game uh, for a Mission Impossible versus Bond is uh, Bond's a solo. And uh, Mission Impossible, even if Ethan Hunt is the, the star of the show, is, is definitely a team approach. And a role-playing game obviously functions better as a team approach. So I was going for a very Mission Impossible type feel. Um, but maybe not to... So I see that as closer to the Bond side of things, but maybe not quite in the occasional cartoonish way that the pre-Daniel Craig Bonds were. Uh, you could do all that. You could do the odd job and Jaws and, and stuff like that, but I, I was looking for something eh, slightly more grounded. So more of like um, the Brosnan era Bond? Um, well, no, I... Um... Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I had to think about that. But sure. Like, I, I'm, I'm very, very fond of the, the Daniel Craig era, but... but um... 
but maybe some of them Brosnan era would be a better touchstone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I like Daniel Craig, but I, I do think he got kind of a bad hand because the first one was, tr- was trying to be closer to the books with Casino Royale. Mm-hmm. Then the writer's strike happened and Quantum of Solace got, got, um, really screwed over because of the fact that the that um the hi, the higher ups decided oh we we don't we don't need writers for this <laughs> you do yeah yeah it was it wasn't wasn't the best <laughs> yeah and things seem to have gotten some degree of direction with when skyfall happened and it seemed like that was kind of a soft reset mm-hmm. and and then no and, time and to die ha- happened, and by that point he had checked out. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but I, I there, there was a lot of storytelling elements of those that I that I really enjoyed, and certainly since this was one of my, you know, one of the things that I was paying a lot of attention to when I was doing all my research and writing, it was to, was how how did action scenes play out. And that's what I used as a lot of the things that I was really paying attention to and trying my best to say, all right, within the limits of a rule system and the limits of people talking around a table, literally or virtually, you know, can can some sense of this action be grabbed? Um, I, I I hope I've succeeded at least in part. Mm-hmm. And when you say the latter Mission Impossible, are you talking like everything after Ghost Protocol? Because... That was kind of a soft reset for Mission Impossible. Yeah, I would say um, I, Ghost Protocol onwards. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I actually have things I like about the first three as well, but it, it's clear that Ghost Protocol was a was a different approach, and um, and I've I've liked all of them since then. Mm-hmm. You know, they've 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 certainly upped things, and um, three. Even though I like parts of it, it was definitely a nadir and has one of my pet and had one of my pet peeves with both of that and some of the Bourne movies. Which Shaky is? Cam. Oh yeah. Shaky Cam, the okay. close up stuff, and since it was Abrams, all those fucking lens flares. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I, I I have um variable tolerance for Shaky Cam and, and the later Bourne movies it was a lot. I remember seeing um uh, the born ultimatum in the theater and and not enjoying the experience, but um, so yeah, I get it, I yeah. get it. I will maintain that. The and do not have the... rules for shaky cam. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I think truth be told, if somebody wanted to put rules for shaky cam at my table, I'd I'd have them drink the pain glass. <laughs> which I, which for those unaware, even though I mention it in almost every interview, that is a shot glass filled with water, salt. Sea salt, pepper, black pepper, Tabasco sauce, red hot sauce, sriracha, and one drop of the bomb. Yuck! It is designed to inflict pain. Sounds sounds successful. Because I f- I figure if if <laughs> if I'm gonna get if I'm gonna try and deter people from not doing something, I have to make the punishment so much worse than the crime. And um, does it work? <laughs> yeah, because I barely have to use it. There you go. <laughs> I've only used it like three times in the last decade, and I'd and I consider that a win because there's I, never yes. a repeat offender with it. <laughs> mostly because they mostly because after they do it, they're in the bathroom regretting it. You you know how it is if you have something real spicy. Oh yes. Oh, uh, but. I will admit, when it comes to the Bourne movies, I consider Supremacy to be the best of them. Hmm. Even with that um, infamous shaky, mo- shaky cam moment. Yeah. If, if uh, nothing yeah, else, for the ultimate flex. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Um, the the sniper that sniper scene. Oh where, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, er, yeah. Early on, the the whole she's standing right next to you. Yeah, basically saying if I if I want if I wanted to kill you, you'd be dead already, or you'd be dead about yeah. two minutes ago. Yeah, that was good. Mm-hmm. Oh, but now with now 
one of the things I did notice in some of the preview images is that you're using full-on photographs, which these days that's a ra that's a rare move to make. I think the yes. last major game I can think of that did um, that did full-on photos like that was maybe Corporea, and that was a few years ago. A lot of people will just use art instead of using photos. Yes. This was a this was um, a difficult decision, and um, when the game was under development, um, we were doing um, traditional art, and in fact, we we had some already done, uh, but a few things came up. The artist, the artist, first of all, I, I, artists are you, you need patience to have good art, and um, the artist I was working with was very honest with me in saying that that I, he was not going to get it done in a timely manner, and. Um, and by not timely, I mean a very long time. <laughs> so, so that was part of it. But the other thing that we, that both he and I recognized was the style of art that he was producing was capturing a bit more of a, um, of a, an eighties vibe than a, than a hyper modern vibe. Um, so I, I took that into account and thought, well, what is, what is the likelihood that I'm going to find an artist who can really kind of capture what I'm looking for and um, that has an indie publisher's budget, right? Um, because you know I've, I've seen some some um, bigger production companies produce very ultra modern art that I think looks really good. Um, but I, I decided to do a little bit of digging into the idea of using photos, and um, and found that um, it wasn't too difficult to find decent stuff, and I liked the way it felt. And, um, you know, we, the, the layout is still ongoing right now, so I haven't really put out much there that has, has that art in it. Um, I, I like the way that it looks, and I know it's not going to be everybody's, everybody's thing, um, but I, I, I think it captures the, the flavor of what I'm going for pretty well. Mm -hmm. Now, with, th with that said, the... This is as good a time as any to dive into to dive into the core the core mechanic of a sort. Yes. Um, because I f I figured out pretty quickly that this is not doing a a archetype. This is not doing a, a class based approach because well you've never really done that. But what is the core mechanic? Are we still dealing with a kind of a variable dice setup? Are is there a particular die that's the one that the that's the all roads lead to Rome? What is the core mechanic anytime somebody needs to do a given role? Okay, all right. Um, well, first of all, um, I know for some people, uh, classes is a, is a is a dirty word, and some people love them, and some people hate them. Uh, I I don't think I could say the game's not does not have classes they're 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 maybe a little bit more flexible than than because of the the number of them but archetypes um yeah i was i was about to say you're leaning more towards archetypes where it's a pat it's a um themed pet themed package rather than sort yes. of rather than something that's direct that's a um direct set of abilities and advancements uh, in, in the sense that it's not as like, well, here at first level I get this, and at second level I get this. It, it's not structured that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are there are packages, thematic packages, yes, that you construct the character from. Yeah. Um, but that's that's not your core mechanic question. Um, I am in, I am indebted in the core mechanic to the Sentinel Comics role playing game. I, I have to uh, fully acknowledge that because it was in, the, my mechanic was inspired by saying I'd like to do other things with this this kind of system, which in turn was uh, at least partially based in Cortex Prime. Um, so the core mechanic here is to take three. Uh, polyhedral dice from D4 to D12, uh, one based on the attribute that you're using, one for the skill that you're using, and one for your stress die, which is how your particular agent deals with um, the imminent death. Um, some agents are, are cool under fire, some are best when they're not having bullets flying, and so anyway, th those three dice are, are gathered up, and under normal circumstances, you're going to roll those, and you're going to be taking the middle of the three results. And uh, normally, a five up is going to be a successful roll. 
-hmm. Now, if you wanted to increase the difficulty, the GM might say that way well, you're going to take the low die for this roll. If there's various effects that, uh, that improve the agent's chances, then you could say you could take the high die on that roll. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is... Ooh. Go ahead. So what, what that does is there is um, there's a reliable enough uh, results that you can still check probabilities... But there is, um, there's still a, a possibility of some wild results on the ends. Mm -hmm. And as I as I understand it, while some game while some games do the attribute and skill setup and have certain attributes directly linked to certain skills, you're acting a little bit more freeform. Yes, uh, skills have. Um, uh, recommended attributes, common attributes that, that they're they're paired with, uh, but not necessarily. Uh, the one place where I did put a little bit more uh, formality to it is um, combat actions, what are combat modes in the game, um, are based on particular attributes, um, based on what they are. Yeah. And within the... Now... Um, within the within the um sample sheet that you had you had sent me, each of yes each of the co each of the core attributes um mm -hmm. had a number in parentheses right next to it. What would that represent? Okay, so that number next to the die size is the score. So when you're first creating the character, you have points to put into each of those attributes to generate to a numerical amount. And then um, with character advancement and abilities, you might have other things that increase the score. And then that score is translated into a die size. Uh, simply, it, it comes down to um, uh, 0 to 4 is a D4, 5 through 9 is a D6, etc. Uh, but as as you use various things to increase an attribute score, that's how the die size will increase. Mm -hmm. Now, given that we're dealing with three die types that that are rolled, the attribute, skill, and the third one, the stress die. Yes. Um, when you've been playtesting this, have you usually had them as three different colors, like using three, um, three different colored dice for each of, for each of those, or? As or has it just been whatever you get, whatever you've been able to grab? Nah, no, there there doesn't. No, they, they've they've just been using whatever dice they wanted to use. <laughs> There's no particular need for the different colors because you're once the dice are rolled, what you're looking for is the actual numbers. At that point, the die size is irrelevant, or where the die came from is irrelevant. Yeah. So when it comes to the when it comes to the stress die, oh yes. Is that is that going to be a kind of is that more or less generated by the overall le overall level of tension within the given scene, or is, how is that uh, no? So so first of all, the the array of stress die. There's three of them that you choose at character creation. You you kind of choose how your agent deals with with bullets flying. So the uh, the three separate stress dice. Uh, the standard, I guess, would, would be a D10, D8, D6. Um, the first die is when the agent is, you know, starts the mission when everything's fine. Um, there is a quasi hit point mechanic, uh, combat training, a little later on in the sheet there. Uh, when that reaches zero, and the agent is using the second die in the array. And then there is a, a status that occurs in combat called the injured status. And once they have the injured status, they use the third die in the array. Mm -hmm. So from when they're fresh, from when they are starting to uh, realize that things are going poorly, and then when they're closest to death, those those are the, the three stages, if you will. Yeah. And in, this, in the same vein, when you talked about the... Um core mechanic you talked about focus points so i'm guessing focus is kind of the um extra effort mechanic within yeah the, within the extra the... effort the hero point mechanic yeah um so when when an agent when the player uses a focus point then they increase the result die so if they're looking at the center die instead they're looking at the high die uh, or if circumstances have required them to use the low die, then a focus point can push it back up to the center die. Mm -hmm. uh, and then focus points are acquired, 
um, largely by by the dice they roll. Uh, in other words, that there's a certain random element to them getting other focus points. Whenever they roll doubles on the dice, on the three dice, uh, they gain a focus point. If they roll triples, they gain two focus points. Um, and um, the reason why I did that um, is, a, is a part of me as, as a game master. Um, I struggle with games that have hero point systems where um, the game master rewards exceptional role playing or really cool ideas. Or I, I think it's a fine mechanic, but I'm always as a game master. I'm I'm very much in the mix of trying to figure out what's going on and and how I can make this exciting and what's going to happen next and all of these kinds of things that I often find out that. I either miss the cool stuff my players are doing, or I in an unintentionally favor one player who's you know more reliable with this sort of stuff. And you want to kind of hand those things around a little bit. And I frankly I don't like doing it. So so I decided to create a hero point mechanic where I didn't have to worry about whether I was the one doling out the hero points. The uh, the effects of the game were doing it instead. Mm-hmm. Now shift. Now um shifting in we is the next thing I wanted to go into is the concept of skill sets which I I guess would be a, I guess would be equivalent to classes but again the vibe I get is archetype for for one and for two um it very much feels like you're like um you're not penalized for dipping into multiple skill sets the way somebody would be penalized for multi-classing in more ubiquitous games correct that's correct um yeah, the, so one way that they're not like classes is the the, the number of them. They, there's there's close to fifty of them, mm-hmm. so there's a, a lot of a lot of flexibility there, and and as you said correctly, there is um there is no penalty or requirements for if you will multi classing that um that each level that you're you choose what skill set you wanna you wanna be. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the in the my current campaign, for example, we we have one guy who has stayed with the same skill set for for all of his levels so far, uh, and I have another one who's barely who pretty much changes skill sets every level. But unlike um, unlike a traditional class system, you're you know as you noticed that that there, there's um, there's usually penalties or or at least a weakening overall if you multi-class too much that you have all of these low level abilities and nothing that's that's higher powered um this game's not built that way there there isn't higher powered and lower powered abilities so you can um, you can more freely uh switch between skill sets and develop a character uh who might be super focused or who might be um you know, quite varied in their capabilities, but both of them are going to perform um, at, a, at a similar level. You're not, you're not going to have the focused guy running away with the show or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Not, not having the spy equivalent of the mage problem, as it were. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Now, with that, obviously with that in mind, I'm not going to have you go through all 50 sk- um, <laughs> skill sets, but since you since you talk about um, characters leveling up at the end of at the end of each mission, and mm-hmm. in the, and in theory going from one, going from one to ten, is leveling up a skill set just getting the new ability in it, or are there other things beyond just um, a ability that you'd get from leveling up a skill set? So a skill set will provide you with some of the other numbers on the character sheet, like like what skills are available for you to improve um, your equipment, uh, your combat training. Those are based on skill set, but those are purely numerical. So it it doesn't matter what level you are in that skill set. And then each skill set also has a list of abilities. So it's not a case where... When you're first level in this skill set, you get this ability, and then when you're second level, you get this ability. It's when you're first level, you get to choose from a list of abilities, and when you're second level, you get to choose another one from this list of abilities. Mm-hmm. So um, I wanted to... Uh, I, 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 Playtesting seems to suggest this has been, been uh, um, accurate. I wanted to try to flatten um, the power curve of 
you know, what in classic D and D, like the, the feet problem, right? Um, of saying that you either needed to climb a feet tree to get the power you really wanted, or that some feats were garbage feats that you had to take, or any. I, I wanted to try to flatten that as much as possible, and then give the player the option to say. Uh, I like this ability and this ability and this ability, and those are what I want to choose for my guy. Um, so, or, or girl, as the case may be. Um, so skill sets have their own individual lists of abilities, and then there's a much larger list of general abilities that's available to, to everyone. Yeah. So I'm, ge so I'm guessing that... in and it's funny you mentioned the... It's funny you mentioned that whole feat chain thing, because would it surprise you if I, say, if I said that Whirlwind attack in both 3E and Pathfinder oh. was my whipping boy for that exact problem. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Because if you go back and look at what you need for Whirlwind attack, it's absolutely atrocious and it creates several levels worth of what I call false choice. Yes. You know, you're absolutely. At certain levels, like you're supposed to be able to pick the a feat that you get, but you already know what you're going to get well in advance. So. So the whole picking is just a formality at that point. Absolutely, um, and I, I no one likes that. No, <laughs> <I've>... <laughs> and it and it's it's compounded even further in traditional Dungeons and Dragons because um, it, it's usually at least a few sessions before you're going to go up a level. So you're 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 looking at a long time of real time play to get a cool thing you want to do. Yeah. There's been a romanticization of pe of people who want to, who want who want to um, talk on end or bo or even boast as if it's some sort of flex about how they've been doing this one campaign for months if not years, but when you're but not every first off not every kind of story is really going to work that way, and when right. you're dealing with something like this. The idea of somebody be somebody being that kind of spy for years on it years on end doesn't really <laughs> quite fit the fiction. Like a lot of people, a lot of people are gonna come are gonna come in, do a job, and get and then disappear, or yeah. they're gonna get moved somewhere else, or they're going to quote unquote retire. But it, it's I remember I remember I can't remember the name of the game, but it it described formatting sessions and campaigns as episodes of a TV series and seasons of a TV series, respectively. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there's been a few games that, that uh, have done that. And I, I use... It's not a formality in my game. I use some of that language in the GM chapter to talk about a way to structure things. And in, in my current campaign, um, we we are talking about the season that we're in right now. So I am trying to create an arc that that works that way. But it's not it's not necessary. But more to your point, it's very uh, effective to have it. Um, where you level up after you complete a mission. And um, and I even talk about this in the book, like, is it does it make sense that all of a sudden this, this agent who the next mission might only be days or weeks later suddenly has these new, new abilities? Um, really, who cares? <laughs> it's, uh, it's not that sort of game. It, it, it just is, this is something I didn't do before, and now I'm showing you that I can do it, and it's fun. Plus, any, everybody knows you don't overplay your hand. So as, right, far, exactly, as, as exactly. far as everyone else is concerned, you always had it. You just didn't have a reason to use it. Um, Absolutely. It's yeah. for this for the same reason when I've done when I've done spy themed games in the past, um, I never used money when it came to when it came to things. I used a requisition license for the agency <laughs> that they were a part of. I.e., you need you need to base basically take basically take the level and experience thing and give it an in-universe reason for why it exists it exists yes doing missions and coming back alive gets you gets you merits that show that you can be trusted with more advanced equipment kind of thing right yes and that 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 is in the built in here as well with the equipment and resources uh, rules. Now, it, as it turns out in the campaign that I'm running right now, I, I burned all the agents in the first session, so uh, they, that that's not applying for them. But um, but yeah, that's that's exactly it. So as you level up, you have more access to equipment, you have more access to resources when you ask for them, um, and so that that's built in very nicely. Mm-hmm. 
Now, when it comes to when it comes to gear, yeah. Um. Obvious, obviously, in keeping with the fi in keeping with the fiction, there's plenty there's plenty of gadgetry to work to work with. Even in something as gr as grounded as as say born, there's either gadgetry or creative use of electronics to yes. work with. Mm -hmm. And that's I think I think in a spy game that's something that you'd have to carry forward. So right. how how do you um, handle that kind of thing? All right. Let me let me say three things. Um, first of all, before I address that question specifically, let me, let me just give a, a very brief rant on on gear in general and spy games. Um, one of the challenges of, uh, of really a lot of modern games, but spy games in particular, is you know agents are given a briefing, players start talking about how they want to do things, and then this this breakdown of a long long period of time where they're just hashing things out and then trying to figure out what equipment they need and looking through lists and um, it's it it has killed the fun of several sessions where you everybody's excited to do all this spy stuff and then it turns into an hour long shopping trip. So I wanted a system that was much faster at that. Now that leads to the question you had about about gadgets. Um, most gear in the game, including gadgets, high tech gadgets, uh, is intended to say. Does my character have what they need in order to make this skill roll without a penalty? Um, and in that sense, you don't need a lot of mechanical details about the gear. I don't. I don't need to know. You know, does this lockpick set have a, give me a plus two on my roll? No, no, my lockpick set allows me to make the roll in the first place. Um, but gear, I mean, excuse me, gadgets could uh, do a couple of things. One is a gadget could be some sort of disguised version of other gear, you know, guns as disguised as umbrellas or what have you. Um, or the other thing that gadgets do, they have a very specific use in a mission, often one that you could not foresee beforehand. Um, you know, that I, I can't imagine there's a time when Bond is talking to Q and said, you know, give me a laser pen, I might need that sometime, you know. Um, so the system is such that in field, if they if it if it seems to fit the scene where they have the the, the gear picks available to do so, where they say, "Do I, can I can I have a gadget that does this thing, this very specific thing in this scene?" To which the GM should be inclined to say, "Yeah, yeah, you've you've used your available gear to solve a problem in the story, which is exactly what gadgets and spy movies are intended to do." Um, so there isn't, um, I've seen other, other modern games where they'll have like a gadget building system or, uh, something where gadgets are kind of the modern equivalent of magic items. And, um, and I, I didn't, I didn't do any of that. It's gadgets are there to solve particular problems. And if, uh, and between the GM and the players, you should be able to come up with some, you know, some appropriate to your tone, to the feel of your game of what those gadgets look like. Yeah. The... The approach of ga the approach of gadgets as magic items to me strikes me as a case of um of of put of putting a um putting lipstick on a pig as it were <laughs> um because at the end at the end of the day even if you call even if you call it ga you have another gadget Discord fuzz oh god damn it oh I don't know why this keeps happening what I was saying is that the Get the um, gadgets as magic items things as a kind of lipstick on a pig thing. I've seen that with some other games where they either do that or have gadgets as quote unquote spells. Um, yes. In the yep. in that Vancian model, which I already don't like the Vancian model as it is, but that the reason I call that lipstick on a pig is no matter how much you dress it up, if it's acting like a spell, whether it's it whether yeah. it's a um a remote control that throws a fireball or you casting a fireball spell. Um, it's the end, it's the same thing at the end of the day. Um, and yeah. as far as and, and it's, some players like it, I it's not not for me, but some players like that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, and for for me, this is a bit less about d like or dislike, and more about um trying to fit the fiction as best as possible. Because right, it's gonna feel awkward if it if right in the middle of your spy game, people start acting like they're playing, um. Warhammer, yeah. for instance, and 
And, and and another disconnect also is even if just if, if it's not as directly tied to spells, but it's a, a list of quote magic items, then you're still trying to tie a specific item to your story, your scene, and that's that's always going to be a bit you know awkward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's and when it comes to the whole when it comes to the whole building thing, well. As nice as it is to have those customizations, that's another thing that the GM is going to have to keep an eye on to make sure nobody makes something too ridiculous. And it's time at the table that's better spent elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And when when you let's cons let's consider Bond's meeting with Q in ev in every um, movie. Usually, mm -hmm. he has a set of gadgets that he's already got lined up for the given mission. Even if some of the now some of those gadgets may not be exactly fitting, but they but the whole thing is Bond finds a way to make them work, or right. they work in a specific circumstance that wasn't exactly in, um, intended, like say remote controlling his car or something like that. Yes. Uh, and if I have to use the non-Bond example, um, I'll bring up the sommelier scene from John Wick. Uh, chapter two. You know, you have you have a lot of the info gathering when it comes to the catacombs under the target where he's where he's going to be doing the hit. Mm -hmm. You have the whole thing of him getting various arms for for the event and how he's going and how he's going to place them. But it's not it's not like he's going in and saying, okay, what am, what am I actually going to need for this thing? Exactly, exactly. If it, if anything. If you look, you look at that conversation with him, the sommelier, he keeps, he keeps asking for suggestions for certain types of scenarios, even if it's right. phrased like he's going to a dinner party. <laughs> like he doesn't say, "I need a shotgun." He says, "I need something big and bold." Yes, and that that can that can be easily be done by by again characters have a certain number of picks that they're allowed to use. You can do them before you leave for your, your mission, or you can use them in the middle of the mission. Like, did I did I put my shotgun in the trunk of the car? Yes, mm -hmm. you did. Let's move on. Yeah. And when it when it comes to the when it comes to the more unorthodox stuff, I do have a. Would it be fair of me to say that some of these skill picks are going to lean into certain bits of gadgetry? Yes. Yep, there are some that are that are more gadget laden uh, than others. Yes, mm -hmm. which does bring me to one one um question that ev that a lot of developers struggle with. Okay. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me address the elephant in the room that's decided to barge in and take a crash on my couch. Let's talk about hacking. Okay. All right, thing... I'm either going to delight you or disappoint you, but go on. <laughs> so, a lot of games have attempted it. Mm -hmm. The results have been very questionable. A lot of them have the unfortunate um, issue of the hacking scene being more of a duet while everybody else goes out for coffee. Right. Uh, so, when... When it comes to hacking, whether it be whether it be overcoming security, whether it be messing with the cameras or, or what have you, do you have that handled as as just a one-off skill, or do you have it handled in something more complex? Okay. Before when we were talking about gadgets, I said I had three points, and I only gave two. And I, and to be honest, I forgot the third. But it's kind of circled back around, so this is good. Um, first of all, um, no, the the Shadow Ops does not use uh, any any sort of hacking duets between the player and the GM. Uh, it does not use that. The majority of things that would normally be constituted as hacking are just skill checks. Uh, it is an area where I did not feel the need to put additional levels of detail because i um i didn't i don't think that it um 
I, I don't think it's especially interesting to watch, honestly. Um, but there is a there is an, a suggestion about if you want to make a hacking scene a little bit more detailed, um, a certain system of contested roles. But but even then, it's intended to be kept short, not a whole separate scene. You know, three or four roles instead. Um, but the third thing that I have, and this is what I wanted to bring with the gadgets before, um, I have a, a suggestion slash recommendation in the GM chapter for certain um, campaigns, including the one that I'm running right now, uh, where the proverbial man in the van, um, that the, or, or the person back at the base who's sitting there before the bank of, of, uh, of their computers who just sort of magically makes things happen, um, can be used. And it's not really right or, or best for that that to be a player character it's better for that to be an npc whose job is to make things happen when they request it as much as the gm wants them to be successful at it uh restricting some player character to be stuck in the van or back at the safe house or whatever so they can occasionally make a roll while everybody else is doing the cool stuff um not not really great so i i did not uh do hacking as a subsystem of any kind mm -hmm. which is Good, and I've been, I will admit I've been seeing people shift away from the idea of hacking as a subsystem in the typical sense. Some will still have it as a subsystem, but it, instead it's more of a different arm for, um, say, combat encounters. Right, the, yeah. the, the spy game did that. The spy game did that, I think, but I think Vault does a much better job with it. Then again, the awesome. spy game is restricted to the to being with to being within that D twenty um bubble, yeah. and st yeah. still being quote unquote compatible, right? Whereas Vault obviously well doesn't, <laughs> yeah. since it's not even using the D twenty system. But and I'm a, and this also ties into how stealth is going to work because obviously that's a big part of you know being a spy mm -hmm. you know being being out of sight whether it be in the black suit kind of stealth or in the i'm here but you don't notice me kind of stealth right so stealth can be used in the the that you just don't notice me sort of way as just a simple skill check that's that's pretty straightforward there is a um the, the same mini system that exists that if you wanted to do a hacking scene is actually a, um, a, a physical infiltration thing that, that I just made a note. You could use this for hacking also. Um, but it, but it's a, a series of, of stealth roles and then depending on, on some of the effects of the roles, the GM gets to introduce certain complications into what's happening. But if, if the mission is to get into a place like that is the mission then you want to play that out you want to play that out with with stealth checks uh, mixed in with dealing with guards with dealing with security systems um and and that's what's going to be your play time but there's other times in which um maybe a step of the mission was well we just need to get into this apartment and get this thing so we can do the thing that's really important uh then you need a, a, a simpler system where you still need some some difficulty of the infiltration but without taking a lot of time at the table so there is a there's a simple system for doing that now in combat there's also stealth the idea for example of uh, people fighting in um you know in a warehouse with high shelving or whatever so they're sneaking around trying to to ambush one another um there is a a, a subsystem for that in combat for doing sort of stealth combat like that mm -hmm. and in most in most things i i wanted things to be fast moving yeah i can i can certainly get that and a common theme with with some of this is the duet issue and part of the reason i believe the duet problem ends up happening is people build their characters to be specialized in a certain area like if you're right. running a shadow run game you're going to have one person who's probably who's probably some form of mage one person who's a decker one person who's a rigger one person who's a face man but it's hard but in in doing that, it becomes kind of tricky to bring everybody into a given field in some cases, um, combat notwithstanding. Yeah. And in that case, you got the straight right. Sam and the adepts for that. Um, right. How do you avoid that particular duet problem when you have characters who have different areas of expertise in a given group? 
Well, um, most of the duet type situations um, are going to be resolved fairly quickly. Um, it is not a case where whether you're talking about a hack or an infiltration or even a car chase or something like that, that this is going to be, you know, 20 minutes where everybody else is going to watch this one person play. It, it's all designed to go more swiftly than that. Uh, the other thing that I use to try to address that is um, all the characters, um, regardless of their skill set, um, are um, maybe omni-competent is, is overstated, but they're all broadly competent. Even something that is not your specialty, you're going to have a passably good chance of, of doing, uh, especially if you have a focus point to spare. Um, so that also means that there is less need to create these duet situations you can rely on oh we're you're for this part of the mission you're going to take the specialist and you're going to go with the specialist and it's and it's going to they're still going to be able to have a a meaningful contribution to what the specialist is doing um i haven't had um, much problem at all with the with the duet situation i think it's a, it's a good term for for the problem um and and mostly because just the things are fast to resolve Mm -hmm. yeah and i will note when it comes to the skills from what i'm seeing something i do appreciate is the fact that knowledge is not a skill yeah because <laughs> that is that was one of my one of my pet peeves with skill systems over the years has been um the overemphasis on on sub skills yeah where, yeah to... you know where where um it's e where it's either just a more specialized bonus, which it which um broad is always go is always going to be more valuable than specialist, yes. or you have ki or you have a bloat situation and things right, like knowledge right. crafting, sometimes different weapon types in some games. Shadowrun's another one. I I know I'm picking on Shadowrun a lot with this, but it um sh it demonstrates a lot of the bad habits. So mm -hmm. oh, it does. So, it, yeah. I understand. And you could you could pick any number of games from like from like the night from like the mid nineties and you'd have this exact same problem. Mm -hmm. But no one wants to waste now, a skill pick on, on a knowledge skill. Yeah, especially especially since you might have it might be a knowledge skill that might be relevant to your character, but you could go whole sessions or even whole campaigns and not use it. Right. Right. So um so what I've done in this is there is one skill called education that is that is a broad i know stuff ability um one of my touchstones for that in the in media is um is uh the the character of annie walker and and covert affairs uh, um played by piper Perubu, that, that she her character just new stuff she would just she would meet a mark and she would just start talking about stuff and i said oh she has a high education skill but also on the character sheet there is a section for knowledges um but they can and those knowledges can be as uh, broad or as specific as you like and if you can work that knowledge into a skill check oh when i'm talking to this guy i'm i'm i also know a lot about london where he said he's from so if you can uh, you can persuade the gm that 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 knowledge is applicable then you get a bonus on that skill check mm -hmm. But that way, the knowledge is like you said. You know, you could be an expert at something, and it may never come into play. Well, at least in this case, it's not. It's not um, burdening your character sheet. It, you didn't. You didn't lose something cool to get this knowledge that you're not going to use elsewhere. Yeah. If you get to use it, cool. If you don't, you don't. And before I get into my next thing, I do. I do want to um, catch up on something. When it comes to bonuses and penalties, would that just be? the uh, a um, static modifier up or down to the center die or would it be stepping up a uh, die uh it's, it's doing um modifiers are uh, all um to raise the die to the high or to the to the low mm -hmm. um there are um very limited static bonuses in the game all right because it screws up the probabilities <laughs> yeah, I, can, I can get i can get that now when it comes to um when it come and I I see a similar thing when it comes to contacts. You're not having contacts as its own, as its own little point value setup. It's unless I'm misreading this, it is its own skill. 
Yeah, it's a it's a separate category. Yeah, I don't remember what Charlotte had for her contacts, but oh. um, but those are those are rated as die sizes as well. Mm -hmm. um, when you get them, you do not have to define them because it's also more fun in game to define that like oh this D six that I have is actually my former contact in MI six. Um, and then based on how you define that contact determines what game effects that contact can do. Um, yeah. Usually it's going to be information or perhaps uh, get you some gear or something. But sometimes you might have a combat capable contact who's like, yeah, I can be there in an hour to help you with a fight or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another tool that the agents have in their toolbox. Yeah. Now, I want to talk a bit about combat modes. Okay. So I I do see on on the sheet for Charlotte that there's a variety of them that are that are tied to di they're tied to different um, attributes. Attributes. Yeah. So is it is it going to be a is it going to be a case where this where these are the types of actions that you could potentially take with say unarmed combat or or with or with firearms and so, and so on. Yes, that's right. So, um, I mean, really, it's it's a it's a bit unnecessary, I suppose. But co combat modes are the are the combat actions aside from things like you know move, right? <laughs> or like um, they're they're the the kinds of attacks that that one can do. Um, and so, for example, the the aggressive combat mode reduces your chance to hit, so it uses the lower die, but it increases your damage die. Uh, that's very simple. But but some of them are are a little bit more tricky. The gun fu combat mode um, allows you that if you successfully take out a guy with that, you get a bonus attack with it. Um, so there's um there's there's what it's eighteen of them, I think. Um, and over a character's career, they will get access to most of them, but they, they develop them over time. So a player isn't overwhelmed like the first time they go into a combat scene, they have to choose between 20 things to do. Um, they'll have fewer than that to start. Uh, but they're, they're designed um, after, again, common tropes in fight scenes of these kinds of movies so that... Not only can you say, I do this cool thing that I've seen in a movie, but that cool thing will actually have a mechanical effect uh, in the game, which was something that, um, that, I'm, that I like in my design. Mm -hmm. So, with, and I'm guessing, I'm guessing that part of, part of the reason in doing this is to ensure that um, if somebody is going to be a combat adept in this, in this particular system, that they have... A bit of variety in how they can approach a situation. Absolutely, yes. Because yeah. the last um, thing anybody wants is to be is to be the standard fighter and just doing basic attack for their whole career. Right, right. Yes, that that is definitely a part of it, and and also so that a combat build if I can use that word, doesn't necessarily have to be tied to. Um, you know, strength and coordination that, that you can be a smart guy who happens to also be an expert fighter, uh, concentrating on smart guy type moves. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that, that, that was, that was a, a design idea there. And also, um, something else that, oh, that, that we do have a combat monster on the team right now. And she is, um, she has a number of ways that she can kill you with a handgun, um, but she does it with great skill. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's especially especially the combat the combat focus the fighter. I I know some might say, well, this is this is spy fiction. Why would you why would you have why would you have that kind of thing? Well. You're gonna need some people who are more adept when the bu when the bullets start flying because everybody knows yes. no plan survives the first encounter for for one. Yes. And t and two, every job has somebody who's the muscle. Right. Yes. the The first part of what you just said was something that with one of my my playtest groups that I had to to talk with them about because um, they were they were doing a mission. Things went sideways, combat started, and after the scene was over, they were 
they were a little disappointed because they said like we were we were supposed to be quiet and and I and I had to say like yes I understand that that is that is something you should strive for but when you look at the the media which inspired the shadow ops um, that's not what happens uh, something's going to go wrong um, and that's that's fun <laughs> uh, there there are you could do a spy game in which the idea is to make sure that no one has ever known that you're there. And I think for some groups that, that if the GM can make that a challenge, that could be fun to do. Um, I'll be blunt. I think when things blow up, it's, it's fun. Uh, I've had, I've had, let's, let's be honest. A lot of those, um, those stories that people have about their sessions usually have some sort of tie to things going wrong or things going exactly. off the rails. Um, right. Or so, or somebody doing something ridiculously stupid that they probably shouldn't have. Um, oh yes, that is so common. <laughs> I've, I've had I had one instance where it was supposed to be one of those hardcore stealth kind of moments. I made the stealth relatively easy be because the consequences for breaking stealth would be so much worse. One of the players tried to break it, and everybody else got on his ass. <laughs> and would not let it go, and would not let it go for days. Uh, and and any time I, that, that's that's the story to tell, right? Not yeah. the story of we did everything right and it was over. <laughs> and every t every time after that, that that would bring up that something would be a stealth mission. I I didn't and keep in mind I didn't incur I didn't encourage or discourage this. I just let this happen. Everybody would just stare at him. They'd say no, they'd say nothing. <laughs> for, so you'd be you'd have everybody staring at one guy for like seven seconds <laughs> while I'm while I'm going through my notes. And yep, I I understand the experience. I know well. <laughs> I know what's happening, but I'm like, I'm just I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just gonna let this I'm just gonna let this play out because this is right. too funny. But I will no, I will note. When I saw when I looked through the sheet, I'd seen um, speed, spirit, and stamina. Um, okay. Yep. Are the are those de are those derived mechanics? Or are they are they something that cascades into the core abilities? Where do where would those three um, come into the picture? So the, the the scores for those are also determined by the skill set, and they they go up as you know as you develop the skill set, and they are also paired up with with an attribute and with the the stress die. They are my catch alls. Um, so there's there's specific rules for for um, uh, combat and the things that can happen to you in combat. You know, getting stabbed or shot or punched, right? Um, but there's all sorts of other things that might happen. Buildings crumbling, cars crashing, poison being injected into you. Uh, if you like this kind of game, being captured and tortured. And rather than make a whole bunch of rules for here's the drowning rules, here's the fire rules, here's the torture rules, um, I just bundle them all up into to to, um, to speed spirit and stamina um, as being um, you you got injected with a uh, with a dangerous virus let's let's make a stamina check to see how you're doing right now and depending on how virulent it is I might say the consequences for failure are grave or I might just say um, you know you're not going to get any focus points for the next scene or something um, or um, I actually have you had a you know an interrogation scene where I said well let's make a spirit check to see you know how well you held up against that and uh, so it there there are three catch-alls to prevent having to have a bunch of small rules for a, a, a hundred different circumstances mm -hmm. now with that with that said obviously with fight you were you we're doing a simulated 2D setup to, well, replicate a 2D fighting game. Right. With Shadow Ops, that, that limitation, because you're not trying to emulate a genre in that sense, isn't going to be present. So do you consider Shadow Ops to be more of a theater of the mind kind of affair when it comes to yeah. combat or grid? Uh, no, no. It, it, is, it is definitely a theater of the mind combat. In fact, there's there's no real support for, for grid other than like the most vague grid of, you know, I'm here rather than there. Um, 
it, it was deliberately designed so that characters don't need to worry about, okay, now I'm going to move over to cover. The presumption in the combat rules is that you are always under cover. In fact, there's a combat mode that instead of being, I move under cover, it's I step out of cover mm -hmm. and shoot from outside of cover. Uh, so no, it is, it is pure theater of the mind and is not meant for, for a grid. Yeah. And to further go into that, what, um, how does you t you talked about how combat training at, um works as kind of a stress track how does mm -hmm. um how does defense work when it comes to taking hits and get and getting hit okay so yeah this is this is a a big part of the combat system so um combat training is a small pool of hit points uh, and when I say small, um, you know, even a even a tenth level character. Well, if a tenth level character was focused, they they might have a decent number. But but I would say even a, a very high level characters probably only going to have um, l low double digits in in combat training. And low level characters might have four or five. It's enough that it will suck up one or two hits before needing to worry about about any other effects of damage. Um, but the main element of the durability of a character is the character's plot armor. So it's a, it's a sl flat out um, meta characteristic. Uh, and it's not on the character sheet because all agents have a D10. Um, and then the, the, the NPCs that the agents face are going to vary if it's, um, if it's, um, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman's character in, in, uh, Mission Impossible 3, um, then it might be a D12. Mm -hmm. If it's, uh, if it's the, the security guard that's, you know, gotten in the way in the, in the bank, it might be a D4. Uh, how important is this character to the story? And that is what determines their durability. Um, so as a result, the player characters as the stars have a high degree of durability and they're the mercenaries that they're, they're finding themselves in a, in a gunfight with have low durability, even if they're described as, yes, these are all veterans of special operations and they're wearing body armor and you know, it, it doesn't matter. They're, they're not important. So they're, they're, they're going to go down more easily. Mm -hmm. Um, so you asked about defense specifically, which ties into this. Um, when an attack hits and, and you roll damage for the attack, um, that damage that, you, that is rolled is compared against a roll of the character's plot armor. If the character's plot armor is higher than the damage, the attack has no effect um, at all. Um, so this means then that theoretically, a character might take a ridiculous amount of damage. Think of John Wick in the fourth movie in the staircase scene, you know, um, a, just a ridiculous amount of damage. And we don't see that the that that such a character really is all that hindered. You know, if you're one of those unfun people in an action movie, like, how is he still fighting? He's been stabbed in the kidney. Who cares? It's more fun to just watch him keep fighting. Right. Um, so the, the defense is added to that to that plot armor roll. And it, the defense fa factor can only be a z uh, negative one, zero, or one. It can't be higher or lower than that. Because, again, otherwise probabilities get skewed. Mm -hmm. um, but what this also means is you might be taken down by any shot at all. Um, if a, if a, an agent or a named NPC, uh, fails a plot armor roll, they don't, they don't go down immediately. They get the injured status. And then the second time that they would fail a plot armor roll, they are either taken out of the fight or if it's late enough a mission in the mission, they die. Um, but so there's a, there's a tension in combat that you might go down very quickly, um, or, um, you might just endure everything but you can't know that and you can't count on that mm -hmm. so it's it is a case where there's still a you can be you have some degree of safety but you're not safe you're not going to be exactly um you're not going to be a walking tank right and i mean you can you can run the percentages on that and i've i've, I've looked at all the percentages and say i have this percentage of being able to to keep absorbing these hits um and uh, but in play, I I've still noticed that uh, that players generally do not want to get hit, uh, which is the right attitude to have. Um, 
but they also like the fact that their opponents tend to go down pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Which definitely makes sense because with certain combat scenes, if you're emulating the source materials, you're going to want to have those shootouts that have a lot of mooks that go down in the dozens. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, the um, the equivalent of the tea house scene in Hard Boiled. I know Hard Boiled isn't spy fiction, but it's leaning. No, no, but it's still still a good call. Arc. Yeah. And one of my favorite sh one of my favorite shooters of the 360 era, Fear, had also referenced that as one of their inspirations. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at that tea house scene, it's not a case of just a few bu just a few bullet holes here here and there. The whole place is getting trashed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> you know, um, cat tea cups and cups and kettles are getting broken. Glasses glasses getting blo glasses getting shattered. Um. The the seats and the like are get are getting sh are getting absolutely shredded. There's debris everywhere, <laughs> with both and sides trying when, to shoot each other. And when you have a combat system that's not keeping track of ammo, that's not requiring you to find cover, when you're not worrying about the toughness of that cover versus bullets, uh, it's a lot easier to narrate that kind of scene and still make it feel like it. It's it. You're not cheating the rules. Mm-hmm. So with that with that in with that in mind given how, given how that there's a lot of a lot of potential for for a very wide sandbox in the, this system do you have plans on putting a little i guess i guess a micro setting of a of a this is what you could potentially do with this setup yeah, as far as, as a micro setting goes, there are examples of that in the book. And and when I say that I mean I mean like a short paragraph kind of kind of thing. Um I I'm I as I was with fight, I'm I'm sort of resistant of telling people what kind of sandbox they should play in. Um so um and I can tell you that even with the ideas I have for expanding Shadow Ops, one of the things that I'm not really looking to do is to say here's here's the world mm -hmm. um because i i think i think as much as there are standard tropes to this kind of media they're not really standardized in terms of their storytelling other than you know spies on missions so um you know you could do fast in the fast and furious with this system and you can do mission impossible with this system but those are obviously very different worlds um and i don't i don't I don't see a need for me to tell people how to make their world. Yeah. But are but you that's, that's are me. you planning on putting advice on how to make a campaign cinematic, for instance? Yes. yes. Every game is some every game is somebody's first in some form. Yeah, I don't I don't do I, I'll, I'll flat out say there's no this is what a role playing game is because I'm I'm well aware of the realities of being an indie designer. You haven't found my game unless you unless you've been playing role playing games. Uh, but yes, there there's definitely advice about this is this is what the 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 tone and feel is supposed to be like. Here's some ideas how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So with that said, what are you shooting for as far as a page count? Uh, th this is good news for me. When I originally set out to, to write it, I wanted to have, to, to have modest, at least in terms of fight. Fight is a, fight is a bullet stopper. I understand that. Um, and, uh, and I, I didn't really want to do that again. Um, however, when I, when I wrote the, for the, the dock up before it went to layout, um, it, it was it was big. Um, but now that it's in layout, it's, it's turning out to be a more modest page count. So, um, we're looking at about 200. Yeah. I'd say 200 is, um, standard. 200 to yeah, 250 is yeah. usually the standard end of things. Right. And, and fights 400. So, <laughs> yeah. And in fights defense, there's a lot of ground that has to be covered when you're dealing with something that is, a little bit off the beaten path as emulating fighting games. Right, right. Especially since there's a lot of variety within that. I'd say an even bigger net than what Shadow Ops is doing. I agree. Yes. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness around here. 
Yes, and thank you for for inviting me back. I really appreciated being here. And and anything and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Thank you. As thank I you. often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> the um the the Kickstarter is live until March twenty eighth, the uh, the noon time on March noon time Eastern uh, time on March twenty eighth. So if you uh if you haven't checked it out, then I certainly invite all of your all of your listeners to check it out. Mm-hmm. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>